Good morning. This is Friday morning, the day after Thanksgiving, which would make it the 27th of November. And uh, what happens now is we begin the, uh, the great Christmas build-up. In some homes, ours in particular, um, don't even really get to play Christmas carols till after Thanksgiving. We'll put the tree up, our Christmas tree up on uh, Saturday when the grandkids come over, daughters, and help get it put up for us. The, um, the season will begin in earnest as we prepare for Christmas celebrations, store sales, for gifts and uh, everything start multiplying, increasing. Now, when I was younger, that usually we, uh, everybody or most everybody, especially stores and stuff, waited till after Thanksgiving. Nowadays, they start as early as they can, make as much money as they can. But in this household, we still wait until after Thanksgiving. And so our preparations for Christmas are gonna begin. We're less than a month away. Um, with the pandemic, uh, we're sure to have some changes and uh, challenges and even probably some um, governmental, um, not really, well, governmental orders, possibly, depending upon how fast the uh, pandemic and the virus surges, uh, definitely suggestions of scaling back the amount of people that we gather together and how we do that. That's already been in place for Thanksgiving and it's only going to increase, I believe, for Christmas unless for some reason there's a complete turnaround of our uh, virus and it ceases to be going up and more people dying and begins to flatten out the curve, as they say. Um, with those changes will come protest, uh, will become fears uh, for some people, and um, many people will begin to feel that enough is enough. Uh, you've taken this away from us, and you've taken that away, and the kids can't go to school, and and we weren't able to gather in large groups and bars and restaurants are closed and how much more can you take from us and and what is really underlying all this you know with the conspiracy theories and stuff um and intensifying if you will of what has been going on because christmas is an intensifying time of many different kinds of emotions and experiences in our lives what I want to do is to begin a series of devotions dealing with Christmas. And, um, and as I did with worship, I see that um, God is using the pandemic as a way of taking the church and bringing us into um, a more uh, realistic and deeper understanding of what uh, we celebrate a lot of our uh, cultural and religious ceremonies around. So, um, whether it's Easter or Resurrection Sunday, slash whichever you like to call it, whether it's Christmas and birth of Christ, uh, the giving of thanks on Thanksgiving, you know, we, we have these days in our lives uh, that we... Uh, see as important ways of expressing uh, some doctrinal beliefs and faith uh, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in our Christian faith. And uh, as a result of that, Christmas is one of the biggies. I think uh, Easter is the other biggie. Uh, for me, I, I, I love them both. I like the cultural aspects that deal with the food, the cookies, you know, all the treats the gift giving, uh, the ham or the lamb or the uh, hard boiled eggs and all that around uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday. 
Um, I, I very, very much uh, always enjoyed the uh, gathering of eating and fellowshipping together with family and friends, people in the body. And, um, and so uh, a lot of that is, uh, is sad to see that it doesn't have the freedoms and the, um, and the joy to it that it has had in past years. But having said that, I do believe it gives us an opportunity to look back into the Word of God and to say to ourselves, what is it all about? I mean, it's really hard to separate the cultural gift-giving and food and celebration of Christmas with all the advertisements uh, in the papers and the stores selling and now on the internet and everything from the actual reality of remembering the birth of the only begotten Son of God, he who is fully and truly God, becoming man, fully man. And in one person, in the person of Jesus Christ, you have the two beings of the fullness of God and the fullness of humanity. Now, and that birth being a virgin birth to uh, Mary, and all of the miraculous stuff that seemed to go around that. And we're going to begin to look at that uh, out of the book of Luke over the next uh, number of weeks as we build up towards uh, our Christmas celebrations. And um, hopefully glean from the scripture uh, some real encouragements that would, uh, even if they were to take away all of the cultural trappings of life that we know and hold dear, we would be celebrating Christmas with fullness of joy uh, and, uh, and excitement. Now, this isn't the first time in history that uh, people, uh, even worldwide, have had to face stuff. We've had two world wars, and those wars have severely uh, restricted and limited many of the holiday celebrations in, in many, many countries. And there has been other uh, plagues and diseases that have ravaged the earth, that have uh, affected things like that. So it's not like we're, we're new on anything. We're maybe for us in our uh, prosperity that we have lived, that I certainly have lived in, in the 70 some odd years of my life, um, there has uh, not been quite as uh, drastic global times as we have now, but um, they're not new. When I talk with my mom, who's in her 90s, uh, she's gone through many things, uh, I believe even far worse than what we're going through right now, and had survived them. And she's gone through quarantines and uh, deprivation due to wars and stuff and uh, the depressions and all that. And so um, we can be encouraged by the Word of God. And in that light, I'd like to read from Scripture. And I'm going to read from Isaiah 7, and this will sound very familiar. Um, and it starts out, um, well, let me give you a little background real quick. We're not going to get too long, hopefully, this morning, but um, Judah is uh, coming under attack from Assyria, who has already all the way the northern tribes and now is uh, threatening Judah, and uh, Ahaz is king, and um, he is uh, in fear because they're, they're in very, very imminent and serious danger uh, of uh, being conquered and hauled away and um, does not look good for them. There is no hope from a natural perspective and of course, the prophet Isaiah comes on the scene to uh, give him a, a good word and encourages him, uh, talking about, you know, what the hand of God is going to go do. And then uh, he says this to him, and again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? This is Isaiah speaking to him. 
Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, for the before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. The land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the days that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So, uh, what we have here, and he goes on and gives more encouraging words, is a promise of a virgin uh, that shall conceive. Now, this has a deeper sense of fulfillment, and we'll look at that later, but the immediate sense is that one of um, Isaiah's children that isn't born yet, isn't even conceived, uh, with a woman, uh, a wife that had never conceived, will give birth to a child. And uh, before this child knows the difference between right and wrong, kind of an age of reasoning, before it grows up and knows what will be right and wrong, uh, wonderful prosperity is going to come upon the people of Israel. It says they shall eat curds and honey, a sign of prosperity. So they're, they're in this dark, uh, very scary, serious time period. And there seems to be no hope, and God comes on the scene and says, this is what's going to happen. A child who's not even conceived yet is going to be conceived. So it gives them kind of a time frame here. It's going to be born, and as it begins to grow up, God is going to destroy Assyria. They are going to be wiped out. Now, Assyria is the world government. It's the superpower of the day. And God is telling small little Judah, one of the tribes of Israel, who have already seen the 10 northern tribes hauled away by Assyria. And God is saying to them, this great, powerful nation will not exist. And great prosperity is going to come upon you. So this is the, this is the sign. Now let's back up a little bit before we get to the sign. Is um, Isaiah says to Ahaz, God says, ask for anything you want. Basically anything. He, he could have asked for the moon. Deep as Sheol or high as heaven, there is nothing in all of creation that Ahaz could have not asked for, that God would have not provided. That is mind-boggling to me. He basically, we have that phrase, you know, ask for the moon. Well, if Ahaz said, I would like the moon, God would have worked out giving him the moon. Uh, no, obviously that seems a little, we know nature and we know uh, the universe, but but that's kind of the implication here is don't put any limits on what you want. Unlimited asking of something. We all know the story about the genie and the lamp and you get three wishes and stuff because you let the genie out. Well, this is God coming through the prophet Isaiah and, and, and when they're in a very, very serious point of time, and saying, ask for what you want. Just prior to that, said, he says to him, though, if you are not firm in faith, you won't be firm at all. So, it's Ahaz's faith as the king of Israel that is being challenged here. It's his relationship to God. And Ahaz answers in a very religious, false humility way. He says, I will not ask anything, and, uh, and I will not put the Lord thy God to a test. Now, why do I say that's a very religious, false humility type thing? Because Ahaz didn't instigate this. God has instigated this. Ahaz believed in God. He was the king over God's people. They had the temple, the sacrifices, the priesthood. They had all this stuff. 
and yet Ahaz and the people were not looking to God for deliverance. They were being crushed down by the fear that was around them. And, uh, and as a result, God in his mercy comes to him and says, ask what you want, I'm going to give it to you. Now, he could have said, I would like you to have the king of Assyria and all of his army go away and never come back again. And God would have said, I will do that. But see, Ahaz uh, was not trusting in God anymore. He was in name, in religion, in culture, but he wasn't trusting in God in heart. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. And so he actually gets a rebuke from Isaiah, because then Isaiah says, well, this is what God is going to do. You, you aren't going to ask, this is what God's going to do. And, and he is going to give them deliverance. He's showing his greatness, his glory, his sovereignty, his power. God is going to do it. And he's going to do it in a way that Israel, Judah, will be blessed for a period of time uh, with curds and honey, with prosperity and peace. But here's the problem. And I see. God wanted his people to come to him and ask him that he might bless him. He wanted that father-child relationship. He wanted that God-worshiper relationship where the people humbled themselves in love before the great God that they worshiped and served, and called upon him to deliver him. He didn't look anywhere else out beyond themselves, but just to their God, and he would deliver them. He would be glorified in their coming to him. God calls us to pray, to ask for supplications and intercessions and petitions. And he says to do it with thanksgiving. And he wants us as his children to come before him as our heavenly father in humility, in love, in gratitude and appreciation for his even allowing us to be his children and to request of him the desires of our heart, that he might pour them out upon us and be glorified in that. Now, he's not going to pour it out upon our lust and our desires, and uh, he's not going to pour it out upon us if we're just coming to him for uh, a handout, give me thing, but we don't really have that intimacy of relationship and humility and submission and worship of him with our whole being and our whole heart. So he, he's not like uh, people coming to the government for a handout. You know, it's, the government owes us this. They need to pay us. You know, they need to give us. They need to help. They need to take care of this. There's no humility in that. There's no submission in that. There's just an expectation of receiving. And although we need to have an expectation of receiving from God, that expectation of receiving should come out of the relationship of a child, submission and love of his Father in heaven. And so as we enter upon these Christmas days in preparation for the celebration of the birth and Savior of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is a challenge I want to begin us with. How are we coming to the Father in our celebrations? In brokenness and humility of heart, in love for the mercy and the grace that is abundantly poured out upon us, in knowing that uh, our God will withhold no good thing from them who walk uprightly. And, uh, and let us be challenged for the month ahead in what it really means to celebrate Christmas together. So we'll look forward to seeing you on Monday morning. Bye.